play some music, Mary Louise. of these scripture readings? Um, I thought, perhaps, you might want to do the blessing of creation. I'm happy to do them. I am. Because I'm not preaching, so I'm actually happy to Okay, to feel free. But I just was wondering if I should wait to start until after we've done a little processing of that first reading.
This morning's worship is a meant to be a counterweight to the amazing opportunity that we're going to have later on to hear Brian McLaren's message and the panel discussion tonight. We thought instead of having one person actually come and share the story, that today we would make this a community story. And so the idea is that we're going to flow through a series of opportunities to hear scripture, have a couple of prompts, and then your responses will make up the story. So we come to tell our story today. You are welcome to worship. Clearing. Do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is your story falls into your own cupped hands and you recognize and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worthy of rescue. Martha Postlewaite.
Colossians 1, 15 and 16. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Christ all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Christ and for Christ. So, when you hear that all things were created, what do you experience in the blessing of creation? What does it mean to you that we begin this service with a blessing of creation? Does it set the rest of the service in any way for you? For instance, if we ended the service with a blessing of creation instead of starting it, what, what would that feel like? What does it feel like that it's at the, be at the very beginning instead of someplace else? That's worth saying in the mic. <laughs> the creation is the beginning, so why not start off that way? Indeed. Friends, let us enjoy a blessing of creation. So since creation is the beginning, I invite you into a time of anticipation, groundedness, all of the words we just named, the experiences at this time where we center ourselves in what is. So I invite you to renew your connection to the earth and begin by taking a breath. And then another. and experience the Spirit of God breathing okay, you. Become aware of the presence of the Spirit of God within this place, and to the east and the west, the north and the south, above us, below us, and within us. Spirit of life, ground of our being, root of mystery, 
which grows into countless branches of expression. Bring us together now. Bring us close to the earth, Holy One. Keep our ear to the whispering grass, quietly, attentively, waiting with slow breaths, listening for the very stones to cry out with their rocky stories of tectonic plates meeting and parting, meeting and parting their mineral memories of molten rocks flowing and joining, their ancient legends of stars born out of the collapse of other stars. Help us to remember. Help us to piece together our oneness with matter our oneness with the earth. With one more deep breath, may we rise, star stuff that we are, moving about the service of this impossible, unlikely blue-green planet. And may we join together to heal what is divided. May we find and create wholeness. May we find it and create it within, without, among, and between. Eternal source, seed of the universe, help us to grow justice. Help us to grow peace. May it be so. And continuing our prayer together, let us join in unison in these words. Holy One, mystery beyond our naming, bring us closer to the earth. Awaken us to our oneness with the soil, the water, and all of the plant, animal, and sea life with which we share our home. Embolden us to see past divisions that don't exist and to honor all that matters, all matter. Help us to grow justice. Help us to grow peace. May it be so. Amen. From the book of Colossians. Christ is before all things, and in Christ things, all things hold together. And Christ is the head of the body, the church. Christ is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that everything in everything, Christ may have supremacy. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In each one of you, embedded, firmly planted within you, is a word of God for God's people. With that knowledge and awareness, I invite you to share God's peace with your neighbor. God's peace be with you all.
mind. Okay. Okay. That was masterful what you just did. Thank oh my you. god. Oh my god. Thank you. So well crafted. Thank you. Thank I started getting some dizzy stuff yesterday, so I'm yeah. <coughs> Actually, second half. So in case you haven't quite gotten the theme yet, this is all about seeds and planting and growing and asking how we grow and what makes us grow. And not everybody gets to go to seeds all the time. How many people know what seeds is? If you are here and you have never heard of seeds, maybe that's the best way to say it. If you're here and you've never heard of seeds, raise your hand. Okay. So seeds happens after worship, 
a group of people gather in Harrison, and there is always some scripture. Usually, it's the scripture that we're thinking of using in worship in the next week or two. And then there are some questions designed to actually get you thinking. And believe it or not, the conversations that you have come back to me. I get to know what you're thinking. <laughs> and as we're having discussions about worship and about themes, it sort of flows into how we choose songs and sometimes it flows into how we shape prayers. And so because we're having this wonderful message today and we won't have seeds, we thought, let's bring seeds to worship. So, you've heard the scriptures from Colossians about Christ being the head of the church and Christ being the body and everything holding together. And we've talked a little bit about the blessing of creation. And so now I've got some questions for you to think about. Do you remember the first time you heard the phrase creation theology? Do you remember the first time you heard that? Does anybody, does anybody want to share a little bit about where you were or what you were doing or how it came to you, the phrase creation theology? Growing up in the church, there was a clear division in talking about theology and creation was not a part of it. And it was in seminary that I heard the first word creation theology and said to myself, where in the world has this been? Because it's an integral part of theology. I always knew it and didn't know how to express it. Uh, many years ago, when we were attending what we called the big church service, or what we call it now, uh, after the service, we met in Carlson Hall, and I met a guy named Bob Brinkley. <laughs> and he started talking about, I think I heard the first, not the first words he said, but were creation theology of, in our conversation. And it turned my buttons on really fast. And I said, we got to go upstairs and hear more about that. So we've been here for the last umpteen hundred years. So uh, <laughs> that's uh, how we started. So I thank Bob Brinkley for bringing it to us. So my memory is so bad, I don't remember the first time I heard this, but uh, what I think now is that it's redundant. It seems like it's just, you either say creation, creation, or theology, theology, because they seem like they're both the same to me. I had come from a history of being raised in the Baptist church, going to congregational church, going away from the church, becoming a Quaker, and then uh, actually practiced in a charismatic church for a while, believe it or not, and believed, I was a believer at that time, and then I felt like God was leading me away from that and to the point of just almost hearing a voice saying, there's so much more to me that I want you to know and I started reading, I found Matthew Fox and read his, started reading his books, the person who's most credited with popularizing creation spirituality. I went to, uh, shortly after my ex-husband died and I was kind of in a point of loss, um, I went to the first, or the second I think it was, Easter celebration put on by Sacred Journey at the old, no longer existing Guthrie Theater. 
And I recognized it right away. This is what I've been reading about. This is, I love this. It was like, just like Bill said, this is what it's really all about. I also started reading Matthew Fox many years ago. I think it was introduced to me by uh, maybe the nuns at St. Scholastica, the monastery. But it doesn't matter because I remember hearing about it and thinking, oh, oh he's a priest. He's going to be in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is not good. But it actually turned out OK for us. <laughs> Um, in my advanced age, my memory is just lost, but I was sitting here trying to think, who, what book was I reading when I, when I heard this word? And thank you, Betsy. <laughs> it was Matthew Fox. And that's about all I can remember, except that it meant a great deal to me, and it must have, because here I am. I'm embarrassed to say this, but I'm, I don't think I'm alone. I think the first time I heard creation theology was five minutes ago. <laughs> Maybe I know what it is and not by name, but I have a feeling I'm not alone. Welcome. As a really young girl, little girl maybe, I remember hearing the word creation story, the creation story. And as I grew a little bit, I realized that I didn't believe it because the creation story, the only context I had was, well, Jesus made this, and on the first day and the second day and the third day, that was how, what he created. Well, I, very at a very young age, that didn't fit for me because I wasn't a literalist. I didn't believe that that happened. I didn't intuitively believe it. So when creation, the word was there, and when the theology, the second word came about, that was when I got it, but not before. Uh, just a brief mention of another important book for me, maybe for some of you, a book called Universe Story that was uh, published in the early 90s, written by Brian Swim and Thomas Berry, um, both of whom I happen to have the opportunity later on to actually meet and be in the presence of. But uh, for me, it was like uh, uh, blowing up the, um, the old big story um, uh, and replacing it or embracing it within this new much bigger story this foundational story of the whole universe. And, um, and then it, it, the, the, the other stories um, th that we inherit from our tradition started to make sense in a new way to me. I'm uh, looking at my granddaughter um, drawing here. And uh, it reminds me of the story of the, the um, teacher saying to the second graders, um, you know, just spend some time drawing. And then the teacher's walking around the room and walks up to this little seven-year-old and, and says, what are you drawing? And she says, I'm drawing God. And the teacher said, but dear, no one knows what God looks like. And she said, well, they will when I'm finished. <laughs> Well, I was raised in the Catholic tradition, and when I got sober, that no longer fit for me. And I, I went through a whole process of exploration, and it ended up being outdoors and nature. And I found God in lots of places, but I didn't know how to find that in a structured service until I came to Sacred Journey. Some of this idea about creation spirituality and creation theology allows for expansion because instead of trying to compress all of our understanding of our relationship with God and our relationship with Earth in this hierarchical domination story, again, remember we said that domination and dominion have very little to do with one another, that dominion, as it's actually in the scriptures, is meant to be about caring 
and about actually taking care of the earth and being in relationship with the earth so that we have this partnership in a way with the non-human creation. And it's not so much this great big hierarchy as it is this really expansive permission of God saying, I want some beings, some creatures, who will actually love and interact with the earth the way that I love and interact with all creation. And so creation theology and creation spirituality gives us a way of understanding that by not locking us into an adversarial relationship and a relationship of domination, but allowing us to expand. If you've never read Matthew Fox, it's amazing to read some of the ideas that he offers and to read them now and realize how revolutionary they were and how gradually we are catching up with the idea that we cannot just browbeat all of creation into submission for our own plans and for our own purposes. So that leads me into the next question, which is, think about the Lord's Prayer for a moment. Now that we understand in the sense that Lord is not about domination and Lord is not about I'm here and you're there, but if Lord is stewardship, what would it mean if we actually reversed that phrase in the Lord's Prayer? The way we think about it now is, you know, our God who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What if we reversed that and it was thy will be done in heaven as it is on earth. We have this idea of heaven as this sort of perfect thing, but really and truly, what if we shifted it? What's that do? If they're, li if they're living in heaven the way we're living on earth, ha, huh, thoughts? It's okay to take a minute and let it sit. We're not rushing. We need some changes on earth. Mm. Heaven does not become a good place. <laughs> it's scary if heaven's like earth. Yeah. It's not a good place. In my, <clears throat> in my heart, I hear it saying that there's unity. Hmm. Uh, between heaven and earth. They're not two poles of existence. Um, and that's a great mystery to me. I me can't too. explain it. But I hope it's true. And that we can become closer to being of, of that place of peace in understanding and acceptance. Hmm. At first, I think it sounded like a big change, but then I got thinking about it, and I'm not a biblical scholar. I can't quote the, the verse, but Jesus himself said, heaven is right here on earth. I, I don't know if those are the exact words, but I've always followed the faith of that we're participating in heaven, if you want to use that term, right here on earth. Mm -hmm. So I think it makes a lot of sense to change it. Hang on, Mike's coming. Hang, hang on, Mike's coming. I was thinking it would be very visionary that if we wanted to pray on earth as it is in heaven, we'd have to work really, really hard to bring into earth so many things that we would all cherish and love that we could actually say on earth as, um, 
in heaven as it is in earth, because then we would want that for all spheres. Right now, it's not a very welcoming prayer. But if we could do that, if we could, it could maybe inspire us to work towards that, that we could have that prayer. If everybody got together and did that. Uh, my thing is that it requires that I believe in heaven. And to paraphrase a question, uh, tell me about the heaven that you believe in or don't believe in. So I need to figure out what's meant by heaven before I can ask. And, and as Bob was, I think, got to, was that maybe they're the same thing. I mean, I don't know if you can separate, but I don't know. <laughs> A few years ago in our wonderful Seeds conversation, which those of you who don't go, I would suggest you try it, my friend Dwight here turned me on to a book called Saving Paradise by two women theologians who were doing some research in the Eastern Mediterranean of early Christian sites, and what they noticed is that there were no, zero images of Jesus on the cross until the 10th century. The Charlemagne era was when that became the dominant vision of Jesus. It's taking away our sins so we could go to heaven. Before that, it was Jesus on earth surrounded by nature, sheep and water and clouds and sun and other animals. This is paradise. Your earth is paradise already. I also, one more thing I want to say is that I actually think this image of stewardship is a little bit of bringing the domination back in. What we need to understand to have earth be paradise is that we are no more important or better or more valuable than any other creature, including any mineral being, anything else that isn't even what we think of as alive. If we had the idea that our purpose here was simply to gape in awe at the incredibleness of it all, the beauty and the wonder, instead of thinking that we have to do something to it, I think we would be in better shape. Obviously, at this point in time, we do need to do something because of the incredible amount of damage. But earth would be heaven, heaven would be earth, if we were not putting ourselves above everybody else in any way. We uh, celebrate earth. Why would we be reluctant to think of earth in heaven? We have old language and old ideas about the, the, the difference between matter and spirit, that spirit is a good thing and matter is somehow defiled. So turning this phrase around helps us to kind of rethink that, I think. So let me just suggest two things. Think of ripe, fresh strawberries. And think of being kissed. Those are very earthly things. Heaven ought to be at least as good as that and sweet tea. <laughs> sweet tea. Heaven, heaven ought to at least be as good as excellent sweet tea on a really hot summer day. I view heaven as what is needed. It's the ultimate goal. And it means taking care of creation and uh, people being kind and open to all. And this is, to me, what heaven is. David says something interesting, and let's just pause here for a moment, when he asks, what exactly are we talking about? The scriptures do reference something that is heaven, and it's sort of, there's this thread that goes through all the way from the beginning when there is this garden to the end when in Revelation there is this new existence that is a new heaven and a new earth. And isn't it interesting that all throughout there is still this thread of human beings having to be in relationship with both non-human creation 
and with each other. And so when we talk about mobilizing to save the earth, does it not require us to be together and balance that sense? Let me push us a little bit further and ask, how do we balance the contemplative, so the sitting in awe and the gazing, and the activist that says, gotta do, gotta change, gotta have. How do we move, how do we move there? I'm going, to push, I'm going to push back a little bit, Betsy, and say that in a way, because we're the only beings that can actually make these kinds of sentient choices, in a way I think we, I don't want to say more important, but our role is different. Because if we lean into that scripture that says we are created in God's image with the ability and the capacity of free will, we are the only beings in a way that can think and conceive and then make our conception reality. So something about that's very different than the, than the other parts of creation. Rocks are wonderful, but rocks don't actually think about what they want to do with an avalanche. It's just an, a, it's an avalanche. We, on the other hand, have the ability and the capacity to think, use our minds, reason, we also have the capacity to make judgments. So it's not neutral if we make a decision to put a road somewhere. It's a, it's a considered set of decisions. And in mobilizing that, how do we think about our role in terms of contemplative? Just sitting back and being amazed and activists mobilizing and shifting. Sit with that for a few seconds and then Let's hear. Well, the thing we have to remember is that we are responsible for the mess that's in the atmosphere today. Oh, say that again. We are responsible. Just stop right there. <laughs> Let's all say that. We, we are, are responsible. We really are, aren't we? Just live with that for a second. We are responsible. Yeah. And if we don't find a solution, we will find this earth uninhabitable for us. Mm. It will, we will not be able to live the way we are living now if we don't do something soon. Mm. Because the carbon in the atmosphere will be, make it so that our life will not be tolerable. Mm. 240,000 years ago, we didn't live. And now we have to find a way to make sure we continue to live. The carbon is too much, and we created that. I like to quantify things. Um, I thought one day, how many people have ever lived on Earth? How big is heaven? Does it hold? 40 billion or does it hold 50 billion people? Well, I, I, all I wanted to do is compare that. There's 7 billion people on Earth today, all right? So 20% of the, I, I asked some people around of how many, do some calculations if they could do from cumulative calculation, how many people have ever lived, and they came up with numbers like 40 billion, 50 billion. But so 20% of the people who have ever lived are alive and living today if the Earth's population is 7 billion. It seems to me that we all have to be responsible for how are we going to handle more people. And it's, it's a responsibility that's mind boggling. I think what I find really appealing and uh, uh, about that flipped perspective is that it does bring responsibility to me to be more mindful of what I'm bringing to the table, how I'm living. And I just love that flipped perspective instead of, well, it is what it is here and perfection is out there and some other time, place, heaven. Um, and if 
traditionally we think of that perfect place uh, to take it on ourselves to make this place uh, as good as it can be, to act as good as we can and thoughtfully, uh, mindfully, uh, and basing decisions on at least some science. Um, but I love that flip perspective because it brings the responsibility to us. Hear these words. For God was pleased to have all God's fullness dwell in him and through Christ to reconcile to God all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through Christ's blood shed on the cross. Lay aside for a moment the conversation about the cross and what it means. That's a completely different conversation and focus in on the idea that we are part of this movement of reconciliation that spirit is doing. And how indeed in our responsiveness and our taking on responsibility, we are actually making the choice, the spiritual choice, the sociological choice, the ecological choice, the organizational choice, and in many ways, yes, a political choice to actually be agents and part of God's reconciliation. And how that changes and shapes the practice of prayer. And as we enter into our prayer time this morning, I invite you to pray as an agent a moral agent, a spiritual agent, theological agent, organizational agent. As a human being, not a human doing, but a human being for reconciliation. What are your prayers? Yesterday, I went to a um, conference on cancer survivorship. And the whole way going, I was like, gosh, I know so many people with cancer. I should have invited them all. And I went, and I listened. And I was disappointed, because I kept hearing things I've heard before. I wanted something new and different. I think I wanted to hear what that magic bullet was that <clears throat> would cure us all. And <clears throat> Excuse me. So I left disappointed, and this morning I was reviewing materials that I was given at the conference with the idea that I was going to flip through them and throw them away. And I realized that I needed to hear all these things, and I know enough about what it will take to live with cancer, to survive cancer, but I just need to act. And I think that's what we're talking about today. I think we know enough. I think we know <clears throat> some of the things that we can do and we should do, and we just need to act. As a community, let's gather that prayer to our heart and hold it there, and then release it. Kathleen, a prayer of gratitude for those who have organized a rally at the Rotunda at the state capitol tomorrow evening for 100% reliance on alternative energy. I'm looking forward to being there, and I hope some of you will come along. Uh, 
I have two prayers and Steve. Um, first of all, the um, I want to pray for all of us that we um, are open to being transformed from within. I think the uh, contemplation action equation has to do with being transformed and transforming persons so that in our action we can do more good than harm. So transformation, there's a, so I pray for our transformation from within to continue as we continue to engage these problems. The other is a very specific prayer for, for people who have been part of our community uh, recently. Um, uh, Anne Buchanan and her husband Dick Lockhart have been part of our community uh, in, the, in the recent past. Dick, as many of you perhaps know, has been dealing with a number of serious uh, health challenges. And the word as of yesterday is that he's moving this week into hospice. And so we, uh, the, uh, Anne has asked us to pray for both of them, for both Dick and for Anne, for comfort and for peace. From um, living two years in India, um, I know what living simply is. And I think if we try to live more simple lives, we will help others simply live. And that includes transportation and diet and energy use and other forms. Let it be so. My prayer <coughs> is one of gratitude. Gratitude for this community. Not because we have the answers but we're seeking the answers. And it's why I prefer Sacred Journey Sunday morning to CBS Sunday morning. I just want to remind you all that it's Mother's Day. Uh, and uh, so happy Mother's Day to everybody, but as in this conversation, I am reminded uh, that the uh, Australian Aboriginal regards the earth as the mother, speaks to the earth as the mother, and the admonition is to tread gently on the mother. So I offer that as a prayer for us to tread gently on the mother. And as we join our voices together, let us pray. Loving, Loving God, God, your word gave all creation the gift of life, and through spirit you sustain all things. Receive our prayers and help us to love and care for what you have made good and holy. Give us wisdom and passion to be agents of reconciliation for the earth, and all its suffering people. Amen. Prepare to bring our offering. I'm going to invite you to hear amazing music so that Hennepin Chime can bless us and then we can continue on in our service. The intention was for them to ring us out into the rest of the day, but the idea of actually having them ring us into this amazing possibility of celebrating action, contemplation, and balance. Hennepin Chime.
is just a taste. We this call is, this the appetizer. Right. This, is our, this is our oral sweet tea this morning. Celebration time, uh, birthdays, uh, good news of any kind you have to share. If you're celebrating a, an important event in your life around these days, happy birthdays and happy anniversaries and just starting something new or ending something important, anything that is good news, you are invited to come forward now. We'll hear your good news and we'll offer our blessing. And um, I guess you can also come forward and bring your offering too, as we're at. <laughs> As well, that'd be fine too. So, who has who has good news to share this morning? Anyone to come and uh, we have some already. All right, good. Right, all yours. We've been talking about the physical creation. Sometimes creation kind of leaves us sad when you look at uh, some of the devastation of uh, creation. I don't know how long it's been. A number of weeks or months. Uh, I wasn't able to be at the 8 o'clock communion service, and uh, so I had to fill in for Stephanie came in and filled in for me. A box that contains my stole, contains cross-stitching that my grandmother had made, a uh, cross from Iona, or excuse me, cross from Ireland. Things that were important to me, they just disappeared. They were gone. Something physical. People said, well, just, they'll show up. I have to confess, first of all, that I didn't have faith that it would. Secondly, I'm here to celebrate the fact that the box showed up, and I have my stole, and all of the things that go with it, uh, physical to be sure, but it's changed my life that I have something back that was important to me, so I celebrate that. Uh, it's my birthday Thursday, and the big celebration I'm going to do, besides going to Women's Book Club, is uh, that I am going to leave for Chicago to see the new two-month granddaughter we have, and then also the cute four-year-old and one-year-old that lives not too far from in Peoria. Je m'appelle Jeanne. Ce mercredi, je vais à Paris à France pour la première fois. Je suis très heureuse et aussi très nerveuse. Um, et aussi, c'est la paix de mon grand-père. Hi, my name is Jan. I'm leaving this Wednesday for Paris, mostly, not really Paris, mostly just France, all around France. I'm very excited and also very nervous because it is the country of my grandfather. Um. A couple of celebrations. One is I had my finals for my second semester yesterday. I'm, I, however, am predicting a B plus, not an A this time. <laughs> Anyhow, um, <laughs> uh, May is a big birthday month in the McNally family. Um, my uh, son-in-law was uh, 51 on May 8th. My daughter was uh, 38 uh, yesterday. Um, and then we start with the grandchildren. Uh, next uh, sun uh, Sunday, my uh, one grandson is eight. A granddaughter is? Eight. <laughs> this one is eight next Sunday. I have a grandson who is uh, six on the Monday and a daughter who is 40 on the Tuesday. So we're celebrating all of those birthdays. We can celebrate if you can remember all of that. Right. That's, uh... That's a frighteningly large amount of cake is what, I, is what, I'm, uh, what I'm hearing. So we extend our hands and hearts in blessing. God grant you many years. Now, he's not in the room, but I'm going to share with you two things that you'll want to celebrate with Jim McChesney. Yesterday, he was 84, and he has a new great-grandchild. So when you see Jim, share love with Jim. 
life and work of the community, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of stuff. Read the stuff. Participate in the stuff. <laughs> Brian McLaren is here. He's going to be here all day with us. If you can stay for 10, that's wonderful. If you can't, come back tonight at 7, and that will be amazing because it's going to be local activists, our local activists, engaged in a panel discussion again about the balance of contemplation and activism. Next week, Doors Open Minneapolis is going to swing through this place, and we are a venue for Doors Open Minneapolis. In fact, if you saw this insert in the Star Tribune, you would notice that we got the centerfold. Yes, yes. And so, if you can volunteer to be a part and to be a host for Doors Open Minneapolis, would you let Cheryl Gibbons know that you can volunteer? You can volunteer at an, for an hour at a time or two hours at a time on Saturday or Sunday. But let Cheryl Gibbons know that either in person or in email. We're so excited about that. There will be a church conference on June 2nd. It's very important. It's the time when we choose our new leaders and when we make decisions about the life of our congregation. You must be here in person to actually participate in that. And if you have not signed a graduation card for Gabe Kemper, please take an opportunity to do that. Last but not least, June 9th is coming. That's all I'll say about that right now. Those of you who know what June 9th is all about, if you don't know, it's a good opportunity to ask, what's June 9th all about and why is it so important in 2019? Hmm. As we prepare to sing our way out into the world, yes, you may bring your offering as we are singing our final song. There are a couple of verses, so we've got some space for you to do that, and then we will go out with joy. Let's stand. One, two, three, one. We're there. There we are. Thank you for this amazing SEEDS discussion. If you've never been to SEEDS, now you know a little bit about what it's like. So drop in sometime not at today. SEEDS, but not today. <laughs> but not today. <laughs> Go out into the world knowing that you are indeed a part of God's good creation. The creation story continues because in the eighth day of creation, all God's children said, Amen, our women, our children, our animals, our creation, ah, enjoy.